Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow Public Speaking and Presentations, Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow, and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and or microphone and or go to the, face, the LinkedIn Live video stream, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. This show thrives on participant contributions and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please either write in the chat room, raise your hand or turn on your microphone and say hi, and I'll be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guest is Kevin Kwam Laux, a pianist and chief executive officer of Chamber Music America. Fantastic. Welcome, Kevin. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Kevin, it's clear to all of us by now that you're an internationally celebrated pianist. Why is it that you uh, dedicated your uh, professional career now to music administration? Well, thanks again for having me. Um, my name is Kevin Kwan Laux. I use the pronouns he, him, and I'm zooming in from the lands of the Lenape or New York City. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a I'm a practicing artist, uh, pianist, and co-founder of the ensemble Trio Celeste, violin, cello, piano. Um, I'm an educator and lecturer, and I'm also the CEO of Chair Music America. Um, your question's an interesting one. I think you know the world kind of likes to organize things into categories. I think it's it's easier to understand, um, but I'd like to think that I think for me and so many of my colleagues, career activities are more about um, the and rather than the or, right? I'm a pianist and a nonprofit executive. I know that one certainly informs the other. And I think in this day and age, uh, to see how careers are developing and evolving, uh, it is the case. You know, so many musicians do so many different things. So How refreshing. Like to, yeah, well, I try and I try to kind of keep an equal footing in, in both worlds because again, it, it informs the other. So it's very powerful. Fantastic. And how how uh, how inspiring that you use music to inform your administration, administration to inform your music. That uh, Wow. So tell us, Kevin, when you first heard about Chamber Music America, what were your thoughts? How did you learn about it? And what was the environment like when you first heard about it? I know it's evolved a lot over the years. What was it like then? What was your understanding? And uh, how did that evolve over the years? You know, as a as a musician, I've always been aware of Chair Music America since I was in college. Um, it really is one of the most reputable arts organizations in the country. Uh, I think if you play in a small ensemble, if if that configuration, if that's the vehicle that you connect to as a means of expressing yourself, um, then I think you know who Chair Music America, who we are. Um, I was first. Um, I, I first engaged with Chair Music America as a, as a member of my ensemble, Trio Celeste. We we're members of CMA. Uh, we applied for a few grants. We were also very much aware of the national conference that takes place in January in New York City. Um, but what I didn't know was that, you know, there were a host of other opportunities uh, that CMA offers to its members, professional development and networking and, and all these other things to help bolster your career. Um, and so our organization now is really leaning into that. You know, we realize that we're so much more than just a granting organization, and we're really proving it through how we're evolving our programs. Um, and I think the big question is, do you rely on, you know, a business model that worked and brought value a decade, two decades, even three decades ago? Uh, or do you take a bold step forward in an effort to be innovative and to transform the experience for your members uh, and the field at large? And that's, that's definitely the direction that we would like to go. Fantastic. And Kevin, so just for people who don't know anything about Chamber Music America, it's uh, so it's between it's a non it's a charitable corporation that provides this support for this niche called Chamber Music. It's for Chamber musicians. That, um, so uh, rather than looking for a grant from the from the state like they do in Europe or uh, from the National Endowment for the Arts, Chamber musicians can come to you for guidance, for uh, how do I say support? promotion is is that a fair estimate yes and it's not just for artists i think what's what's really great about the organization is that it supports the entire ecosystem um, performers uh, educators managers uh, presenters i think there's a whole ecosystem uh, that supports the chair music field and we're here for them you know we're here to support them and provide resources opportunities to network learn uh, and grow together how exciting. Let's take a look and see what Chamber Music America is like from the perspective of some of its members. Here is the Duo Scorpio. Hi, we're Duo Scorpio and we're a New York City based harp duo. And this is why Chamber Music matters to us. We believe that Chamber Music allows you to have an intimate conversation and connection with another person while you're performing music. And we believe that this translates to the audience's experience with the music as well. That's why chamber music is so great. Hi, we're Duo Scorpio. Okay, so now let's, we've heard them uh, talk the talk. Can they walk the walk? As they say, here is Duo Scorpio performing.
Fantastic. So there we have it, the duo Scorpio performing. Uh, so, and how uh, wonderful to see exactly what you, know, you were saying, Kevin, about how it's not and it's not or 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 the duo Scorpio. They're playing the harp. They made a music video. They're performing new music. I mean, it's it's really inspiring. And I, I imagine that's where we're going to go with our uh, our further part of the conversation. This is where we get into the heady portion of the show, where we'll be talking about. What exactly is chamber music? This is roundtable number one. In his expose, What is a Musical Genre? Musicologist Carl Dahlhaus asks why a fugue is not a musical genre, but a mass and a string quartet are. He writes, and this is my translation from the original German, quote, a mass, or more precisely, the polyphonic music setting of the Missarium, Ordinarium Missae, is determined by always setting the music to the same text which it is based on, by its liturgical function, which it fulfills, and by the high style, which it should maintain. A string quartet, on the other hand, is determined by the type of compositional form it represents and by its aesthetic distance to popular music and culture, end quote. He continues, quote, it is doubtful that the fugue represents a genre, although if we talk about it as a genre and contrast it with the sonata, a fugue is exclusively a compositional technique which is determined by rules about theme development and counterpoint and is neither bound to a concept of form nor an instrumentation nor an extra musical function. For that reason, as a genre, it is, quote, undetermined. By including the fugue and the canon as musical genres, we foreclose the possibility of a viable definition of genre concept for the purposes of writing music history. In historical reality, the concept of a genre is exclusively meant as a historical category and not as an, an, an aesthetic judgment. A music genre is inher an inherited standard that a composer makes his own. He can evade it or reveal it. And that standard even governs the connections between criteria of varying dimensions. A structure of composition technique doesn't constitute the essential nature of a genre until it is related to a sociological function or a text and is not an instrumentation by itself, but rather its relation to a form type and to an aesthetic social character. The trio sonata of the 17th and early 18th century is not defined as a genre by the composition of a movement a tre alone, meaning a structure made up of two upper solo voices and the supporting role of a basso continuo, but rather by the function of the sonata da chiesa or sonata da camera, which it fulfills. Not every work for two violins, a viola, and cello is a string quartet, according to the genre concept which formed itself in the late 18th century, end quote. So Dollhouse wrote that around the time that Chamber Music America was founded in 1977. CMA was founded to support and promote a specific definition of chamber music, the original definition of which was made clearer when it was redefined in the year 2000 to include jazz and world music. And then in 2016, when the CMA board of directors and staff declared that, quote, we realize that Chamber Music America was born from the Western classical music tradition, which evolved within a society that practiced many forms of racism and exclusion, some of which continue today to impact our members and our communities, end quote. Today, CMA defines chamber music as, quote, music composed for small ensembles with one musician per part, generally performed without a conductor. The term once referred only to Western classical music for small ensembles, such as string quartets. But today, chamber music encompasses myriad forms, including contemporary and traditional jazz, classical, and world music genres, end quote. So Kevin, I'm sure you will agree that Dollhouse understanding of musical genre as quote, historical categories and not aesthetic judgments, end quote, is still the consensus understanding today. Likewise, chamber music is still widely understood as the string quartet and friends. And for the same reason that rock and rap music aren't generally considered chamber music, neither is jazz, nor world music. My question is, what exactly is chamber music today? And if it becomes too inclusive of other music genres, is it still chamber music? It's a lot. 
Thanks for thanks for sharing all of that. Um, and it brings up some really, really important points uh, and things that we think about actively every day. Um, I'd first like to just acknowledge and say that structures exist that absolutely exclude and prioritize inequity, whether it's educational systems, programming, um, performance opportunities, even, even in the philanthropy world, um, these inequities exist. And I think that what has been an amazing personal journey for myself is acknowledging, you know, my own privilege, you know, and, and looking around and saying, asking myself, you know, what do I see? Um, what do we want to change? And then of course, to have the courage to make things better. And I think CMA is a perfect representation of that, um, of taking that step. Uh, and they did so, so early on in 2000, when they started to include it. Um, these other genres. And I think that our programs and inclusion efforts in general represent an action plan uh, that CMA has embraced to really prioritize a more just arts ecosystem. And with chair music specifically, what's amazing about it is that it really represents a truly evolving medium. You know, it, it really is not just string quartets and piano trios and duos. Um, and I think that you're seeing it today. You're seeing it in artists incorporating technology. You're seeing it in how they embrace improvisation, as well as unique configurations emerging as a sort of norm, like two, two harps. Um, I think that the, the creative spirit is absolutely boundless, and ensembles are showing us, um, they're showing us that by, by blurring the lines, um, by making music in ways that they feel represents them and their unique voices. Uh, and they're doing it with courage, which I, I really, really appreciate. And I think from an organizational standpoint, CMA would really be irresponsible to not embrace and support the field when this is what the field is calling for. You know, as a service organization, your I think your chief job is to listen, you know, to observe and listen and figure out ways that you can that you can support um, support the great art that's that's happening that's being created. Um, and so, I grew up a lover of jazz. That's actually one of my favorite genres to to listen to. I'm just always in awe um, when I hear jazz musicians play. And it is pure chamber music, the way that they're interacting with one another, the way that they listen, um, and their ability to respond to one another is so much different than in the context of, of a traditional piano trio, like the one that I play in. Um, we have certain confines that don't allow us to do certain things, um, but I think in, in small jazz ensembles, that is kind of the engine. That's kind of what uh, determines um, you know, their characters and ensemble and the decisions that they make artistically. And so that's been a really amazing learning experience to see how we can embrace and support all forms of small ensemble music making, um, because frankly, we need to. Okay, wow, well said. Let's have, uh, let's take a look and see what that can look like in practice. Here is Amina Figueroa and her jazz band.
Fantastic. So there we have it. That was Amina Figueroa, If Barrels Could Talk. And we see that that was a, it was a commission from 2019 of Chamber Music America. And we see again, Kevin, uh, linking only ands, ands, ands. So we have uh, strings with uh, a jazz band, a new composition, all during the, the COVID pandemic linked with pictures. Uh, I, I guess I believe that's climate, climate activism trying to show us about uh, global warming. I mean, extraordinary. Yeah, the playing is is amazing, you know. And when I when I see the the musicians um, interacting and engaging with one another, it just there's so much that we can learn. I think from these kinds of collaborations, which are not traditional, right? And I think that it's just it just sounds so so wonderful. So I'm glad that we can support projects like that. So Kevin, I remember being at a um, it was a the uh, it was a, a commencement ceremony at the end of a, of a school year at a university, and they were giving an honorary doctorate to a, another academic from another university. And this was back in the early 2000s. And during her speech, she said, you know, diversity is what makes the world go round. If, if, if we see this diversity in nature where, you know, if one plant is gone, you know, everything pretty much dies because that kind of breaks the uh, that breaks the, the whole natural way things work, the whole ecosystem. Uh, do you see that in the same way with this? Is this your um, understanding of this kind of inclusion, that so-called cross-fertilization, where you bring these people together and they create something that uh, otherwise, I mean, uh, just would be uh, inconceivable? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the amazing thing about artists. I mean, they they kind of know. I think they kind of inform the decisions that we make as a service organization. Um, and we're seeing that that cross fertilization, that that you know graying of boundaries, we're seeing that so much, uh, and it's it's amazing because artists are basically saying, look, um, in this configuration, I may not feel like it's the best medium for me, for whatever reason, and yet when I'm playing, you know, in this kind of ensemble type with this kind of uncommon uh, instrumental configuration, I feel more at home, you know, and I think that that's not up to us. Um, or anyone to kind of establish for anybody else. I think that that's the beauty of art um, and the trust that we that we give and place uh, with artists to kind of tell us, um, you know, the best ways to express themselves and what we should be celebrating as a snapshot of the world that we live in. So fantastic. And so now uh, we're going to move into the second roundtable, which uh, kind of goes around uh, this environment in which Chamber of Music America operates. Because we understand Chamber of Music America can have its own position, but the reception from the outside world is just as important. What other people are looking at, what other people understand is relevant or valuable. So let's take a look now. This is the um, second round table. Who are the current standard bearers of Chamber Music excellence in the United States of America? Why are they considered the field standard bearers? and what might chamber music excellence look like in the future? Kevin, returning to our discussion about the definition of chamber music, if we observe today's high profile chamber music concerts, they seem to fit nicely into the Dalhousian quote, historical categories we just discussed. Last year's Grammy Awards for chamber music showcased a conservative understanding of chamber music and its champions. Let's take a look at those awards right now. So there we have it. That is Best Chamber Music Small Ensemble Performance winner, Beethoven Cello Sonatas, Hope Among Tears, Yo-Yo Ma, and Emmanuel Axe. Then we have here the other, uh, I believe, Bui was the name of the album by the Amani Winds. So a wind quintet, Archetyped, Sergio Asad, Cla Clarissa Asad in Third Coast Percussion, Akiko Seven Pillars, Sandbox Again Percussions, and Jack, the Jack Quartet, whom we will listen to in a moment. Adams, John Luther, lines up, lines made by walking. So in any case, we have these, uh, shall we say, four seemingly more uh, progressive understandings of chamber music, small ensemble performance, yet the winner is Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe, Beethoven's cello sonatas. So I go on, if I can find it. Yeah, furthermore, later that year, Grammy award-winning cellist Yo-Yo Ma 
and pianist Emmanuel Axe performed the same music at a chamber music concert for other members of the World Economic Forum, all of whom are the world's decision makers. Let's take a look at that. So here we have Yo-Yo Ma, who is a member of the World Economic Forum here, says here, one of the important things he does, if we read down here, is maintains a balance between engagements as soloists with orchestras worldwide and recital and chamber music activities, okay? And here is the annual meeting, our shared humanity concert, Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe. And of course they performed Beethoven. Is that what we see down there? Great. So Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe are standard bearers of chamber music. So if Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe are the standard bearers of chamber music excellence today, why might that be? And what might chamber music excellence look like in the future, Kevin? Well, this is a difficult subject, I think, um, because a, a lot of it is just about personal preference and um, perception and how things resonate with us on an individual level. You know, although there are artists that, you know, I look up to, it doesn't necessarily mean their music uh, should have a similar impact for someone else. I mean, that's that's the beauty of, of art and expression. Um, I will say like our granting programs, they're designed in a way of, you know, to recognize chair music that is influence and potential. You know, it's one of the ways that we're celebrating art and artists who are practicing today. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, Emmanuel Axe and Yo-Yo Ma are incredible musicians, you know, and with, with long and illustrious histories. Um, but I, I would not venture to say that anyone is a, you know, it represents a standard of excellence. I, I just can't, I can't bring myself to say that. I think that that's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a contested word. And, and I think um, it's difficult. So I would just say that in general, uh, it really has to do with personal preference, what resonates with you, um, the values that you have. And when you hear music and you you hear artists perform music that you feel like aligns with those values, then you know it's something uh, that you may want to aspire to or that inspires you. Uh, and again, that's what's so incredible about art is that it's totally subjective. So Kevin, and more, more about that then. So uh, we saw actually the list of Grammys, I believe they have several members. The, the nominees yes. were, were several, I think perhaps all four very well-known members of Chamber Music America. Uh, so that also does speak volumes about that, even though uh, Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel Axe and Yo-Yo Ma were the ultimate, uh, uh, received the award. So tell us a little bit about this, um, this connection of Chamber Music America then to something like a conservatory or to um, this idea of professional, the professionalization of music. When I was reading uh, that Chamber Music America decided to include jazz as its, um, as, uh, as chamber music back in 2000, I immediately thought about this uh, Juilliard program, which they started their jazz program, I believe in the same year. So it was really, uh, it, I mean, is this, um, what's the connection there? Because we were talking before about, well, chamber music, it's, it's professional, but maybe it doesn't have to have such a focus on, you know, who um, plays the best uh, Beethoven sonata or who, you know, who is, um, uh, wins these competitions or is esteemed by the public to be, you know, like uh, the, the number one winner or something. It doesn't have to necessarily be judged by those criteria, does it? You're absolutely right. I think it's these kinds of awards and competitions, it's very problematic. It's very problematic for the field. Um, I think because, for instance, and again, I, I'm not, this isn't a direct criticism of the, of the, the, the latest Grammy winners or the list, um, but I think that it would be, an interest, it would be interesting to see a, a move away from, from kind of a conservative effort there um, to promote great artists who are who are really trying new things and um i actually have that album of yo-yo ma and and emmanuel Axe playing beethoven it's beautiful i love it um but i also know that andy akiho's seven pillars is brilliant you know and it's bold um and it's a classical commissioning recipient from chair music america and so we're very proud of it and so it's it is interesting to kind of see how awards and competitions and these kinds of accolades and attention 
um, shaped some amount of public perception, I would say. Um, but I think that it's um, the great responsibility of artists to continue to just push um, and to continue to be authentic in the way that they're expressing themselves. And I think that the ensembles that you saw on that list, on that Grammy nomination list, are certainly doing that. And they're doing it in really spectacular ways. And I think in music circles and like smaller uh, communities and circles, we're all very aware. Uh, and we absolutely are cheering for them because they're doing great things. And Kevin, so tell us a little bit about now this conference that's coming up. You said you mentioned before that uh, this conference is an important thing that you learned about uh, when you first uh, got to know Chamber of Music America. So when, if I was to come to that or any of our viewers were to come to that conference, can they expect to meet these people like the Amani wins? Can they, um, what, what exactly happens there? And what is that? Because uh, I get this impression as you were, you were talking about Chamber of Music America, that it has kind of that, um, yeah, it has a it has a, a, an influence also like the Grammys in a different way that it's it's shaping the field. It's also promoting those, as you mentioned, those new experiments and saying yes, you know, you yes, you can. So tell us um, uh, what what can we expect if we go to the conference? What other ways can people get involved in Chamber of Music America if they say, well, you know, I've got a great Chamber of Music idea, or you know, I need I need this kind of support, and I'm not Yo Yo Ma. How, how do they do that? The conference is an amazing gathering of professionals. And it's it's a gathering that brings people from all 50 states. Uh, we all come to New York uh, in January. This year's conference dates are January 5th through 8th, so you should definitely come. Um, and it is just a celebration of the small ensemble field. You know, there are performances, there are lectures and panels, there are learning workshops. Uh, there are all sorts of opportunities to engage, to learn and to network. Um, the field doesn't really have a gathering like this. And so it is really, really unique. Um, this will be my first in-person conference uh, as CEO. And so I'm just absolutely thrilled uh, to be welcoming our members and, and, and members of the field uh, into, the, into the conference at the Westin. So definitely come join us. Um, but again, I would just say it's, it's a, a really unique opportunity to hear great music, to meet really important people, uh, to expand your your professional and personal networks uh, and to learn. Uh, we're really focusing on our learning verticals, which we're launching at the conference. Uh, there are workshops on financial literacy, on grant making, on receiving grants, panels and such. Um, and so there's just a lot of things that you can come away with um, that can help fuel you know, your vision for your ensemble, for your business, for your organization. Uh, and that's really what we're focusing on is value creation uh, and providing those resources for, for our members and attendees. How exciting. That's fantastic. Now let's have a listen to another. This is uh, the Grammy nominee, the Jack Quartet, and this is John Pickford talking about why chamber music is important. Let's have a look. Why chamber music? Because collaborating takes you to the most unexpected places, musically and geographically. Why chamber music? Well, I guess that was a short one. Let's um, now listen to the Jack Quartet. Beautiful. 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 Beauti
So that was pretty experimental. That was Beautiful Trouble by Natasha Deals featuring the Jack Quartet. And I believe that is also, uh, was also a commission of the Chamber of Music America. Wow. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so we see in that video, Kevin, then all of the things we were talking about before, but definitely very adventurous. So I believe even it was incorporating that those so-called mashups where you use these previous video materials and put them <laughs> put them together and to 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 make new art forms. I mean, so uh, where where is that? Can I say? How do I say? Is that that's clearly contemporary music with you know this kind of uh, colliding with pop culture? Where does that fit in Chamber Music America? Is that kind of representative of the the most avant garde, or is that uh, what? Wh what are your thoughts on all that? Well, luckily, our membership community is really creative uh, and really inspiring and doing really interesting things. And I think that's a perfect example of that. The Jack Quartet—they're amazing, you know. And I thought that was really, really interesting. I'm very proud that we could be a part, you know, a small part of it. Um, but that's what's so incredible about particularly the commissioning program and and um, investing in new works, things that, you know, are not uh, yet in the traditional in the standard canon of, of repertoire and literature. Um, and what I think I love most about that performance is just that um, it represents who they are in this moment in time. You know, it's uniquely them. Um, no one else can take that from them. Um, it represents their their unique artistic voice um, played really well. Um, it just has all the ingredients for something that's that's really special. Um, and actually, um, I, I just came across a wonderful quote by Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge. Um, and when she was talking about contemporary music, I mean, she was she was so important uh, in in moving music forward um, by funding so many important commissions like Appalachian Spring, Apollo. Um, but she said that um, my plea for modern music is not that we should like it, nor necessarily that we should even understand it, but that we should exhibit it as a significant human document. I thought that's the perfect way of thinking about new music for those who are less adventurous. Um, I think that acknowledging it as, as a moment in time right now, reflecting where that ensemble is, their commentary on the world around them. I think that's that's why we all love art. That's why um, that's why we go to performances. That's why we go to museums um, to understand people's diverse perspectives and to celebrate them. Fantastic. And uh, then you make me think of a, of a show, an episode a few weeks ago. We had uh, the entrepreneur scientist Gino Catani and Simone Ferriani there. We were talking about Coco Chanel and how important the development of her design brand was because, uh, um, well, actually the development of the design brand was so indebted to Picasso and to Stravinsky and to these, all these contemporary people who, you know, today we think, well, they're classics, you know? And so that is, it seems like maybe today we say, or I say, wow, that's pretty adventurous. That's kind of out there tomorrow. And it seems to be, well, that's just, you know, the way things are, that's the new classic. So fantastic. Um, so now I wanted to ask you about the challenges facing Chamber Music America. How um, do you, I know there are many, many of these challenges. How does Kevin and his team at CMA plan on facing them and overcoming them? Kevin, in the past years, the past years may have been more difficult for Chamber Music than any other time in recent memory. People couldn't mm -hmm. safely meet in the same room to make music together. The virtual meeting, like the Zoom meeting, seems to have bridged some forms of human separation, but are still inadequate for chamber music making. The pandemic is far from over, and there are also many other challenges facing chamber music. What are those challenges, and how do you and the CMA team plan on overcoming them? Where to begin? That's, that's the question. You know, I'll just, I'll take this question from the starting point of when I when I started at CMA a year ago, it really I thought my 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 chief responsibility in the beginning was to really look at all of our programs. Um, as a service organization, you have to ask yourself, you know, how effective are your programming uh, initiatives? What do positive and good outcomes look like? How do we get towards those outcomes that we that we desire? Um, I was asking a lot of questions. 
about what our role was as a national service organization for small ensembles. Um, and in turn, we, the team, have really been challenging ourselves to be more, to be more relevant. Um, I can say that for my entire adult life, you know, I've witnessed and seen and experienced artists working at a deficit when it comes to time and energy, uh, and even on the financial side, or maybe especially the financial side. Um, and personally, what what worked for me was was to realize that I didn't have to victimize myself for the benefit of the art. What I mean by that is you can step into other things um, that will empower and inform your creative voice. It goes back to that and or comment from the beginning, right? Um, I think if we if we try really hard to squeeze ourselves into singular categories, we're really limiting the strength um, of diversity from different activities, what we learn from those things, the people that we meet and how it informs the other. So because of this, at CMA, we're really focusing on two newer components, learning and new opportunities to test those learnings. We feel like that this is the, a really incredible foundation um, that will spur growth um, in our granting programs, um, that will create more membership and more community amongst the members, um, and something that will really take CMA into the future. Um, we're learning, or we're launching a learning vertical in 2023, you know, and these are formalized opportunities to acquire business skills. You know, that's the one thing that I never got uh, as a conservatory trained pianist, um, an introduction to business skill development. Um, it's hard to know if I even would have taken that class if I were in school at that time, because I was so focused on trying to get better, right? But I think that now, I mean, when I go to various universities and talk to students, there's a, there's a different kind of awareness among students now. Um, there's kind of a, a hunger for, for, for more experiences and new skills. And so we want to provide that through our new learning vertical. Um, we see it as an investment, uh, a greater investment that we're making in our grantees, rather than just giving somebody um, a certain amount of money to do an artistic project we're giving them that money, but we're also giving them training and resources and a network of other um, grantees to work with. And so we believe that through that cohort uh, and through specific learning tracks, uh, that they'll be more successful. That's more sustainable than, than spending money on a recording, in my opinion, because those skills will continue to develop, um, they'll continue to grow, and then they'll transform into new opportunities for, for the grantee. And so the learning vertical is a really important component that we're really leaning heavily into. We're also reimagining our physical place in New York City. Our office is a beautiful office. Um, it's in Koreatown in Midtown, New York City. But we don't really serve our community, the community of K-Town. They don't even know we're here. Right? And, and the other thing about the office space, even though it's beautiful and a place, a great place to do work, we're all virtual, right? We're working really. Um, and the space doesn't serve artists. And so I think that that was one of the biggest issues for me was that this space doesn't actually serve arts or the arts community. It just houses our administration. And we've proven over the past two years that we can work remotely. So this office uh, is currently on the market. Uh, we're selling it. And our intention is to uh, purchase a new venue in New York City um, that will have a concert space, a recording space, uh, a space for convenings to occur, meetings, and our annual conference. So we know um, what kind of investment that takes, but we also know what kind of return that it will bring. Uh, I think it'll bring unbelievable uh, opportunities for our grantees, for our members. Um, it'll be a wonderful place to convene for our, for our national conference. Um, but I think to have a physical space that is actually serving artists um, is something that we've never really done. And so um, in addition to diversifying revenue streams through various activities in the space, um, I think it's a really great way to not only de-risk the organization as we head into the next fiscal year, but also a way to bring unbelievable value uh, to our members and to our constituents. So wow. yeah, very so, excited. Um, how inspiring that idea of that it's not just about giving out money and saying, okay, you know, okay, go make a CD. And of course, 
times times are changing, as you mentioned. And it seems like I also get that impression when I, I speak to conservatory students, when I'm I'm in those areas. These people are really lonely and they have been working so hard at perfecting their craft, you know, and uh, ironically, the specialization time, you know, where, okay, somebody else did the movie and you just play the cello or whatever. It seems like that's, that's really changing a lot as, as you're, as you're, as you mentioned. And I, I think that, um, that it seems like you're bringing that opening that idea of the chamber music as that social, that social vehicle and you're opening that even more you're bringing in people and you're saying okay here's the money but i want you to network at the same time i want you to do this together i want you to learn i want it to be a collaborative thing and that through that i mean it it seems to me that you're really in a very very relevant way redefining chamber music it's something that happens it's that phenomenon of people getting together who have different talents and the same passion and working together is that more or less that right no i and i appreciate the kind words and it's it's what we're what we're built to do as a as a national service organization um you know it definitely has its challenges but these are these are clear aspirations for us um we're confident you know we know we can do it and we know that we can help the field you know we can help artists we can position them uh to be successful and musicians and artists are incredible problem solvers when you think about it i mean that's all we do when we look at scores we're thinking about how much time passages are going to take to learn you know we i mean there's just so much um thinking that goes into uh the analysis of a score especially when you've been playing a long time uh and that same problem solving as we're getting around tricky corners this and that um as we're getting around those things i mean we're taking various inputs um, you know, we're working together to try and problem solve. And then there's a lot of individual work, there's group work. These are the perfect ingredients, um, you know, to be building um, business cases, to be building programs and projects and initiatives. And it's just that I think artists have never thought of themselves in that realm necessarily, because it feels so, um, so different from the creative process, but it's actually the same. And so I think that with the introduction of some of these skills, um, artists may look at their community and say, hey, there's an incredible need here. I have this incredible art here and I know how to suddenly make this connection where my art will be not only well-played and beautiful and I have fans and people that adore it, but I can actually serve my community in this way. And I think that's where the problem solving comes in because that's been one of the chief problems is that you have these highly skilled workers not enough opportunities because the opportunities are very, very kind of singular um, in their focus. And again, I think that's one of the reasons and why I think artists today need to be looking at all sorts of different things, right? Thinking of the and, not the or, thinking about the different experiences that kind of define who they are and their voice and their experiences, and then how they can kind of bring those all together and then take a bold step forward. And so we feel like we can do that. We can help artists find that whether it's through training, whether it's through community with cohorts of other members and grantees, whether it's through funding, which actually um, may end up looking like one of the more dull portions of the organization in the future, because the other ones are so dynamic and kind of untraditional in the way that we're trying to apply those, those learnings. Fantastic. Wow. Very exciting. Really looking forward to this conference uh, in January then. So, yes, you'll come as my guest. So <laughs> I would be honored. Thank you. So let's take a look and see what Chamber Music America is to the next generation. Why Chamber Music? Well, why Chamber Music? Okay, well, I really love Chamber Music because each person in a chamber group is playing their separate part and it all comes together. Um, as one message. Chamber music is really like a conversation between people without words. Sometimes there's things you want to say that you can't say through speaking and that's the things you can say through music. Well, for me, chamber music is the best way of expressing myself. Chamber music helps tell a story without using words. What do you think? It makes you joyful. For me, it lets me connect with other people on such a deep level. 
I think the greatest part about chamber music is uh, the community that comes with it. It's like exciting to play with other people than just playing solos. I mean, it's funner to play with people than just playing by yourself. I always thought it was funner communicating with people. Pianists can get lonely, so chamber music allows <laughs> me to collaborate with other musicians in a way that I couldn't anywhere else. I've made so many friends playing chamber music. For me, chamber music is a stress reliever. It helps you cooperate in a group, and that's a really good skill to have when you're older. It helps me see different perspectives on music that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. It's really taught me how to listen. Usually I try to be the boss of everything, and chamber music has helped me to slow down and listen to other people's ideas. For me, chamber music really improved my like team building skills. It's really taught me responsibility because you can't come unprepared. Once I practice and work hard on it, it that gives me a, a, a lot of satisfaction. And also, it's, it's just really fun because we become friends. Yeah. <laughs> the happiest moments of my life are when I'm playing chamber music. Teamwork. <laughs> Keep doing that. Chamber music. Teamwork. It makes me feel happy. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm sorry to uh, Yo Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe. The 2023 Grammy has already been given away to those young people. So they're <laughs> they're amazing spokespeople for it. I you don't need me here. Just have, just show that video. That's wow. It was amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Kevin, last thoughts for now, for today, for this, the end of this show, what do you wish chamber music? You know, I, we have gone through an unbelievable time, you know, a very difficult time. Um, and I just, as a message, I think to all ensemble players and to our members, I mean, we're, we're here for you, you know, and we're actively working to be a better organization. Uh, one that supports you uh, with resources and skills and, opportunities. And um, that is kind of why we're here. It inspires us every day. Your work inspires us. And that's why we do it. And so looking forward to welcoming you back to our uh, national conference in, in January, on January 5th through 8th in New York City. Um, and stay tuned for more exciting updates. Fantastic. Let's see how we can stay in touch with Kevin. So here is Chamber Music America's website. It's easy enough to get to. It is chambermusicamerica.org. And Kevin, Very so people, excited to say it's actually being updated, and a new website will be launched uh, in about a week. So, oh, fantastic! Okay, fun. and and uh, in the meantime, people can still reach out to you by uh, absolutely. They they just go down here somewhere. There it is. Contact us. Membership. Okay, perfect. So reach out to Kevin with your questions or comments, uh, and uh, so that's chambermusicamerica.org. There it is. So excellent. Wow, thank you so very much. Kevin Kwam Laux, Chief Executive Officer of Chamber Music America. Thank you. So let's take a look at next week's show. We have here Tempesta del Mare, excuse me, Tempesta di Mare, Philadelphia Baroque Orchestra. Imagine yourself seated at a table in 16th century Tuscany. You are the guest of one of the most intellectually elite households in all of Italy. No, you are not at Cosimo I de Medici's house, but rather at Vincenzo Galilei's home. Vincenzo, the father of astronomer Galileo Galilei, is a well-respected musician who just arrived back from Venice, where he learned state-of-the-art music theory from Zarlino. Vincenzo admits to you that Zarlino's theories about musical consonance and dissonance, i.e. the rules of harmonious music, are convincing and foresees them influencing music even into the 21st century. But Vincenzo suddenly gets angry and he pounds his fist on the table. I don't care if Zarlino is the music director of St. Mark's Cathedral, he exclaims. There is no passion in his music. Then Vincenzo gets eerily silent and looks at you as if to confide a secret. He whispers, music should reveal, music should reveal the feeling behind the words. With that, Vincenzo picks up his lute and starts singing in first person, the words of Orpheus, who is eternally separated from Eurydice, 
his beloved wife. His sad music and song breathe life into the words he sings and emotion overcomes you. Tears run down your face. Seated at that very table, you have just taken part in the birth of opera, the quintessential art form that ushered in a new musical era, which we now refer to as Baroque. Tempesta di Mare is Philadelphia's premier Baroque orchestra for a reason. Every note they perform adheres to Vincenzo's vision of music as rhetorical craft, a, con a conversation that conveys all of human emotion and expression. Come welcome Tempesta di Mare to our show, and let's find out just how they do it. Oh yeah, and if you can be sure you won't be brought to tears in front of your new date at one of their concerts. As always, all information about upcoming shows can be found at www.timimemorial.com. Once again, thank you so very much to Kevin Juan Laux. Thank you to Agnieszka and Benoit Rivole for their support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From New London, New Hampshire and New York City, New York, goodbye and see you next Wednesday. Thank you. Bye.